name is uh, Tanisha. I'm the assistant pastor here. I'm so glad to be with you today. I'm excited about the word. I'm excited about what God has for us. So let me just pray. God, we thank you. Thank you for this time. It's your word that washes and cleanses us. We need your word. So I pray that you would open up our minds, our hearts to receive whatever you want to plant in our hearts so that it would grow into a harvest into our lives. Open our ears, open our minds. We pray against the enemy who want to distract us. God, I pray that let this word be impactful to our lives. We thank you. You get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God. Um, I just want to um, go into this word, and um, it is entitled All or Nothing. All or Nothing. And I'm already coming out the gate. Y'all got to put your, put your seatbelts on because I'm coming out the gate. All or nothing. And I'm concerned. It came out of a heart that I'm, I'm kind of, I'm really concerned about this iteration of Christianity as it's showing up in our modern times. And I fear that we are living in a time where the gospel has been cheapened. Anybody know what I mean? It's been cheapened. Um, it's like having a knockoff brand of Christianity. Now, I'm not bad. I'm, not, I'm for knockoffs. Anybody like a good knockoff every now and then? Every now and then, I can't do the Gucci or the Versace, but I can, I can look like it, right? Knockoffs are, are, are a blessing sometimes because it looks real, but it's not as expensive. So this is what I'm concerned about. That Christianity as it's showing up in this times, it looks real, but it's not as expensive. You know, it's comfortable. It's a convenient gospel. I come when I want to. I do what I want. It's just my life with a little bit of Jesus sprinkled into it. Just a little, little Jesus here and there. Jesus is an accessory, not the outfit. You know, Jesus, I'm, I'm just concerned. Um, there is a, um, a quote. I don't know if you've heard it before, but it says, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you everything. I want you to think about that. Salvation is free to all, free to all. But if you want to lean into discipleship, now that's going to cost you. Because uh, accepting God's gift of salvation is freely given through faith, but actively, somebody say actively. Following Jesus as a disciple means actively aligning your life with his teachings, which can involve making personal sacrifices, changing behaviors, prioritizing your relationship, and putting God above others. See, I'm concerned because I didn't even get a lot of amens. I'm a little concerned. Um, this, I want to show you this graphic, and um, I know we haven't had the Way 101 in a while. Guys, we're working on it. We're sorry. But this next graphic is something that we usually uh, show people in the Way 101. It just kind of shows where people are in the light of their trajectory of following Jesus. So this is, um, I'm, I'm still in the way. Okay, let me go on the side. Most people, we, we like to encourage everyone at the Way to make themselves uh, down this circle. So everyone starts in the crowd. You know, we're in the crowd. You know, all the crowds, y'all remember, the crowds follow Jesus. They are always pressing into him, the multitude, all the people around them. Oh, where's Jesus? He's doing bread today. You know, they just following, right? But then um, Jesus wants us to move from being a crowd to a follower. Uh -huh. Like, follow me. Remember he told people, come on, follow me. So this is trajectory from a crowd to a follower, and then you make your way to be a disciple. Like, I'm actively pursuing, I'm following this rabbi. Remember, I'm following into his dust, right? You're getting dusty. And then that's when you become a leader, right? You can't lead from out here, right? And I think what, that's what we want to do. Like, where's the usher board? I want to be on it. Wait, hold on. We're going we to we go move from the crowd, and then we become a follower, and then we become a disciple, and then we become a leader. Amen? Amen. So that's our goal. But I want to talk to you today about a very interesting story. It's our lectionary passage about a, a, a man who was almost a disciple. 
He was the almost disciple. Very interesting story. It's found in Mark 10. And you could either follow along in your own device or Bible. Anybody still bring a Bible to church? I'm just, I have to, look at, look. We got two paper saved people. Three, yes, look at them. I know, it's, you know, we live in a different age. No shade. Just interesting to see where people are. Um, Mark 10, uh, it starts in verse 17. And it says, as he was setting out on his journey, he is Jesus, a man ran up. First of all, why are you running up on Jesus? No, just kidding. <laughs> Let me go back. Sorry. As he was setting up on his journey, a man ran up, ran up and knelt before him and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and come, follow me. 22 is cold. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. My God. 23. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, boy, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to him again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, that, well, then who can be saved? Because, dang. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, everybody said, all things are possible with God. God, amen. May the Lord bless God's holy word. Now, somebody already panicked. I, I can feel it. Say, oh, Lord, Jesus don't want me to have no money, Lord. I already felt it in the room. Like, what you mean? Jesus don't want me to have no money? What am I what I'm, I'm working for? All these things, these sacrifices. Um, um, can someone close that front door for me? Um, but th this, is, this story is much deeper, much deeper than money. It's much deeper. We think that this story is all centered around this man, his wealth, but I want to submit to you that this story is much deeper than money. All right? Let's take a journey and talk about it. This rich young ruler, he intrigues me. I, was very, I thought about him all week. I'm very intrigued by this young, rich, young ruler. Just by his name alone, described who he was. First of all, he was rich, right? But look at his name. He didn't, they didn't even bother with a name. Like, his name is Rich Young Ruler. Rich, that means he had money. He balling. He got she, shot calling. He doing all the things. Wearing the best robes. Probably had a chariot. Yeah. He's rich. He has money. The next thing, he's young, which is impressive. Okay? He's rich. He's young. He's a ruler. That means he's a boss. He out here calling shots, like telling people what to do, right? This is the epitome of what winning looks like in our society. Isn't this what all the commercials are about? Especially for us ladies, we want, they want us to be young forever. Use this cream, that cream, this mask, this, cause I'm just supposed to be young forever. I ain't never supposed to age. So this, uh, our, 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 our society uh, puts people on a, on a pedestal who are rich and young and running things. It's the American way. 
It's what you live for. You calling the shots at a young age. You are worship. You like, oh, he's you. This man was on the uh, top Jerusalem Forbes under 20, right? <laughs> under 40, Jerusalem under 40, right? He's doing the things. And I was impressed. I was like, well, what is a ruler? He, he was the ruler of the synagogue, so of a local synagogue. In Bible times, this person was primarily responsible for the physical upkeep and the organization of the local synagogue or their local church, right? Uh, it includes managing the schedule, services, picking out who's going to read the Torah, what scripture, ensuring proper decorum during worship, overseeing all the arrangements and gathering within the community. He was really doing things. Now, he wasn't a religious leader, but the ruler of the synagogue held an important position in the community because it was administrative. Yeah, he was like the executive assistant. He was the one that's in charge of everything's running well when they came together on a Saturday to worship all together, right? Um, this position was appointed and uh, filled by respected Jewish community members and chosen by elders. So all the community looked well on him. He was unanimously voted into this, into this position, even though he was young. This means he had some get up and go about him, which was really impressive. I am very intrigued by this guy. He was on the fast track. He was upperly mobile. He was hitting all the marks, checking all the boxes. He had it going on. We would have looked at him and been like, well done, you, you see, he's doing good. Look at this young man. We would have applauded him, doing well. But he had everything, yet he still wasn't sure if it was enough. Just think about it. He was, run, he was doing the things, and he was like, had one question for Jesus. Um, um, excuse me, sir, how can I uh, get eternal life? But you were doing all the, I thought you was doing the things. Somewhere, maybe all the things doesn't hit all the boxes you think they do. Have you been there before? You finally graduated? Yes, graduated, did that. Now what? Finally got that job. Now you got it. Now you're looking, you still on Indeed, looking at other stuff. Finally got my boo. Booed up. Now you're looking through, scrolling through therapists, marriage therapists. What happens when you hit all, you've done all the things, and it still leaves you empty? So many people, and I often wonder, I'm like, Lord, just give me a chance. Because if, you, if I don't hit the lottery, I promise I'll, I'll do right. I'll pay my tithes. I, you can trust me with, okay, that's here nor there. You can trust, just give me a try. But it wasn't enough. He had moxie. He had status. He was a ruler. He was doing all the things, and his question was genuine. It was sincere. He came to Jesus in broad daylight when all the religious leaders and all the other people were just coming trying to trip Jesus up. He really came with a sincere question. And I just want to take, let's just walk through this conversation because Jesus is something else. I'm telling you, this, this conversation is very intriguing. Let's interrogate it because it gives us, a, the, we see the clash between human perspective and kingdom perspective. Amen? All right, so let's go to that first slide. I, I, I nicknamed him R-Y-R because he's the rich young ruler. And, um, and it's just a breakdown of the conversation. And he came to Jesus and said, good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? This is totally a, a human perspective because he said, what must I do? Uh -huh. See, he's still on checklists and boxes. He's still on doing all the things. What, I'm, what am I supposed to do? What do I do? Just give me what to do. Give me a list. Give me a check. Give me a formula. Give me something. What do I need to do, Jesus? I, I got to do something. I have to work for it, right? And he comes to Jesus, but Jesus wanted to do something uh, different in him because he thought he had to do something to merit eternal life. Whereas Jesus taught that eternal life in the kingdom of God is a gift to be received. It's not something you do. It's something you receive. Salvation is not on your own merit. 
It's the human in us that makes us feel like I got to do something. That's why salvation, when you really get it, is mind boggling. It really makes you think like it's too good to be true. This can't be right. I have to do more. I have to do a cartwheel or a flip or give money. You telling me all I have to do is receive? Can't be. Just like if someone gave you a birthday present and they're, you're just so happy, you don't go in your pocket and be like, now how much I owe you for that gift? All you do is what? Receive. Receive. This is salvation. For grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Not of works, least anyone could, should boast. See, God knew what he was doing. He knew if we had a say in it, we would be like, yeah, you saw what I did for salvation? Yeah, you saw You like that? Yeah, yeah, we'd be in heaven and be like, yeah, I, I started a church, you know, that's what I did. But he made it where nobody can boast about what they can do. Our only boasting is in God. How many are glad about it? So he came, he already started off wrong, what I got to do. Jesus like, well, well, you know, I'll get to that. And Jesus said, wait, hold on, before you carry on, I got a question. Why do you call me good? I love this. The clapbacks of Jesus. I'm telling y'all, I'm writing a book called The Clapbacks of Jesus. Because Jesus was really giving it to me. He said, why do you call me? By the way, hey, thanks. But why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. What is Jesus saying here? Is he denying who he is? Is he telling him, like, you know, yeah, you got the wrong dude? I think what Jesus is doing here is genius. Because remember, this is a religious, uh, he's a, a part of the synagogue and all these religious rulers who were doubting Jesus. He said, um, hold on, if you if you saying that I am God, you better recognize and before you address me with such a title, you had better think soberly about the implications of what this means if you're saying what, you're, what I think you're saying. If you call me good, then you must admit that I am God love this about you. Oh, you calling me good? Oh, so what you saying? I'm the Messiah? Is that what you're saying? Are you, are you saying I'm God? Because only God is good. So am I a really, am I a good teacher in your, in your I want to hear from you. He wanted to know. So are you coming to me admitting that I am the one or are you just, you over here playing? This is, is so good for us because we too must recognize who we're talking to in prayer. When you pray to God, do you realize who you're really talking to? The Lord and King of the universe? And we're like, God, can you just help me pay my phone bill? Do you remember who you are dealing with? God Almighty. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that God is. Do you believe that God just is? That God is who God said? God is... And he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek. If you coming to me, you talking about I'm good, then you might be, you must be saying I'm God, which was a big deal for that Jewish community. That's a big deal to admit that I think we're talking to the Messiah. So I love Jesus. He's like, okay, what you really saying? All right, let's keep going with these with this conversation. Jesus this then tells him, okay, got you. You coming to me, you want to hear eternal life. Okay. Bet. You know the commandments. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear fault witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. Bam. At first, it seems like, hey, Jesus, what you doing? That's the wrong answer. Anybody ever, did you read this and be like, Jesus, what, what you doing? That ain't the right, that's not the right answer. That's not how you get eternal life. Is this how we get eternal life? By following rules? Did Jesus misspeak? I was like, Jesus, what are we doing? Why are you telling that man this? Or was Jesus telling him, uh, indeed, this is the way to show him that the law can only take you so far? The law can only take you so far. You did all these things. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. You did a, and he said, oh, yes, teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. It's giving goody two-shoe vibes. Is giving overachiever. Is giving a type personality. It, it feels like he's the kid who will remind the teacher that the homework is due. Y'all yeah. remember that kid? Y'all yeah. on your way to recess and they, I'm Miss Jenkins. You remember that one kid? That's what he's giving me. 
I've done all the things he said. And he might be right. As a Jewish boy, when he turned 13, he was responsible for living out God's commandments. But keeping the law was just a matter of external conformity. It was just for show, really, to see where he, uh, Jesus was kind of getting deeper to his heart. He's like, yeah, I did all that. Checked all the boxes. Have you ever felt like that? You know what? I'm doing all right. I'm not like them. I'm not like my cousin and them. I'm not like my family used to be. Anybody ever just did a, a quick little analysis of your life in comparison to those around you, and you figured out that I'm doing all right, given my circumstances and given my trauma and the stuff I've been through? I've been, and this is how he felt. You know what, Jesus? I've, I've been doing stuff. I've been reaching the, the goals. He said, I, I, oh, I got you, Jesus. And I, I can imagine he felt confident. Y'all imagine with me. He's sitting at Jesus' feet. He's knelt down, and he says, I've done all these things. Can you imagine that, that, that sense of relief when Jesus said, okay, you want an eternal life. Do this and this. He's like, oh, yes, yes, I did that. Did it. Oh, I'm in there. Can you imagine how he felt? Like, oh, yes, sweet relief. I knew I had eternal life. And then something very interesting happens. I love this about Jesus. It says in verse 22, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Isn't that amazing that that's in the scripture? Jesus looks at this guy and says, you know what? I like this kid. This kid is, you know what? He is really, look at him, a little tink tink, just over here trying. Look at you. Jesus looked at him and loved him, even though he was wrong. What does that say about your life? What does that say when you was in your state of being in the confusion? When you wasn't doing right and you knew you wasn't doing right? I, I said to someone, to, to, um, I heard someone preaching and said, um, as you imagine God, what is God's um, expression, do you think, towards you? Because God's always in a good mood. Did y'all know that? Do you know when God looks at you, God's smiling? Did you know that? Or do you imagine God as frowned up, looking at you, shaking his foot? (laughs) Now look what they're doing. How are you imagining God's looking at you? And even in this point of this guy's life where he might not have been, he may not have been all the way right, Jesus loved him. Jesus didn't say, oh, man, you ain't no sinner. Jesus didn't say, you know what, you're going to hell. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus didn't say, um, so who you think gave you all this stuff in the first place? All the things Jesus could say, no. This is a stark contrast to how Christians have dealt with people they don't agree with. Where did we go wrong in not reading this verse? Because when we don't agree with people or we feel like people are wrong, this is not always our reaction. We ain't looking at people and be like, you know what? I love you. What's your little wrong self? You're just wrong, but I love you. May this be our reaction towards people in our lives that may not even have got the whole revelation yet. Do you remember when you didn't have it all together? Do you remember when your theology was still forming and you was believing questionable things and yet someone loved you through that this is I love this about Jesus oh my gosh he looked at him and loved him and then Jesus dropped the bomb Gap band style y'all don't know nothing about that drop the bomb Jesus said all right okay okay let's see okay you followed all the rules okay I got you you did all the things. I, I, you know what? I really like you. I, I want to, you know, you should be in the crew. I like you. All right. You lack one thing. Somebody say one thing. One thing. You lack one thing. Okay, this is what I'm going to need you to do. Go, go sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Hey, come follow me. Now, you know, he didn't just hand out them come follow me's. That was just like 12 people got them. 
That means Jesus was like, I like you. You could be in the crew. Let's go. This was a special invitation, VIP. So amazing. The one thing. Jesus put his finger on the sensitive place that that man had by commanding him to go and sell some things. Is that what it say? Go, just go sell half. Just give a, 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 a 10%, a quarter fraction. He told that man, go sell all. All you had, give it to the poor. Because, you know, we're, we're, we're blessed to be a blessing, not blessed to be a hoarder. Amen. You know, that's, that was, that's the mission. Amen. Not that accumulating stuff is to how much the Lord blesses you with is how much the measure that you could be a blessing to others. Y'all know that? We're a conduit, not a warehouse. All right. And it's interesting that, God, that Jesus said, you will have treasure in heaven. Because it goes back to the original request. What did the first thing he asked? What was his first request? How do, what do I need to do to ha- get eternal life? Sir, Jesus just told you you're going to have treasure in heaven. He's answered your question. And then how did he react to the answer? It's a cold piece right here. He answered his question. You want eternal life? I got you. Do this one thing. It's the now versus later. It's the delayed gratification that humans have a hard time with. Um, y'all remember the show, Let's Make a Deal? Then anybody used to watch game shows with your grandmama when you're supposed to be sick at home? Y'all remember Let's Make a Deal? And it was always that point of angst when they're like, you have $2,000 in your hand right now, or you can give it all away for what's behind door number one. You remember, they're like looking at the audience like, I don't know what to do. You know, remember that? And then you remember when someone was like, no, nah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep the money. I'm going to keep the money. I'm going to keep the money. And then they opened the door like, you could have had a trip around the world. You know, like something amazing. And they're like taking their little money and being sad and go sit down because they missed a full house of appliances. I don't know. It used to be a whole thing. It was a whole thing. But with God, it's not a bait and switch in this, in this scenario. God's not offering you something just to trick you. God's not giving you something you're going to get less than. God's not just giving you like, well, give it all away, and then, oh, well, we're just going to see what happens. Jesus is always giving you more than you can give Jesus. Jesus always outgives us. Always outgives us. So y'all hang with me. He said, come follow me. This, for this man, there can be no following Jesus before he went and sold everything he had and gave it away. His wealth and all that it meant to him in terms of position, status, comfort, and security prevented him from entering into eternal life. My God, what is your one thing? We all have a sensitive place. Yes, we do. For him, it was money. Uh-huh. But what's yours? Because it's easy for us to look at him and be like, mm-mm, that's a shame. I don't know why he did that. <laughs> but what's yours? What's yeah. mine? Yeah. Is it comfort? Mm-hmm. You know, we worship comfort. Yeah. We need comfort. I just got to be, got to be just right, just right temperature, just right. They got to not too much, not too little. You know, is it, is it status? Is it your influence? Is it power? Is it your reputation? Is it intellect? What is your one thing? I want you to think about it. Because this is what sets disciples apart from crowds. Please hear me. The real cost of following Jesus is truly all or nothing. I want you to think about this. Cashing out completely. Jesus, I'm all in. I'm sold out. My mind is made up. Why? Please hear me. Because Jesus is the prize. Do y'all understand the paradox in this? Jesus is the prize. When you sell all out, all these temporary things, 
we gain Jesus. And I'm also, I always wonder, is Jesus enough today for people? In this modern iteration of, of Christianity, is Jesus truly enough? Because if you knew the Jesus I know, when you get to know Jesus for yourself, Jesus is the prize because there's the only place you're going to find purpose. In Jesus is the only place you're going to find peace that passes understanding. A joy that's unexplainable. See, what you, you, what you get in Jesus is something inter internal. It's something you can't buy or you can't sell. Jesus is the prize. Uh, in, in Matthews, it says, no one can serve two masters. It just keep hitting us with it. right hands and left. Come on. No one can serve two masters. Even you, either you will hate one or love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other because you cannot ser serve both God and money. Can't do it. I know I told you it was more about money. It was more than money. But let's get back to money because it's not always the material money. Sometimes we're rich in other things. We're so rich in ourselves of our own opinion. We're rich in our own viewpoint. We're rich in our own intellect. And you can't have both. I'm talking about real Christianity. I don't, I don't even mind if it's quiet today because these are things that we need to ponder if we're not going to have a cheap iteration knockoff version of being a Christian, uh, yeah, it's going to touch you. This one, this one going to touch you. This is a pattern that Jesus uh, uh, had throughout his whole ministry. Y'all follow me on this. Look how um, circular Jesus' teachings always ended up coming full circle. He told the people on the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh -huh. Isn't that amazing? Blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt. Those who come to God admitting, I don't have it. I ain't got enough. I'm poor in my spirit. I don't, I don't have enough to save myself. Jesus said, you know what? You bless when you get to that point. When you realize I ain't got nothing to contribute to my salvation, you are blessed because you get it. Right? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. They're not rich on themselves. When Jesus was calling the disciples, remember the first 12? It said they dropped their nets immediately. You know what nets meant? That was their business. That was like you had a brick and mortar and you're like, oh, well, well, I'm following this guy. You didn't lock up. You didn't do nothing. You just left it. People walked away from their tax collecting tables, left money. I always think about y'all left money. Just I would have just like grabbed a little money and then... Went with Jesus. They left it all. Yeah. This is the one I love. When Mary, y'all remember when Mary anointed Jesus feet with the alabaster box? We love the song. You don't know the prize. We love that song, right? But he said of Mary, check this out. Truly I say to you, whenever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. I'm often sad that we don't talk about Mary enough because Jesus said every time we talk about the gospel, we're supposed to be talking about Mary, but it's even deeper because we're talking about what Mary did. When she broke that alabaster box, she gave all. There was no unbreaking that. She didn't just be like, God, Jesus, I'm going to give you about five drops, and that's about it. You can't, once it's out the box, you can't put it back in. She broke it completely. This is what the gospel is. This is why he said everything she does is always going to be told around the world because this is real salvation. Giving all. Breaking it. Pouring it out. To where I can't even get it back. It's already out there now. This is what Jesus was talking about. Giving all. Somebody say all. 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 Jesus didn't just give a piece of himself. He didn't say, y'all could just, I'm just going, y'all just cut right here and I'll give my part of my arm. Jesus didn't say, yeah, you know what, I'll just go in a coma for y'all and then y'all going to be all right. I'll give you a foot. No, Jesus gave what? I love the description of God. It says, our God is an all-consuming fire. You know what that means? That, that means you don't just get a little bit in the fire. When it comes to God, he takes it all. 
Y'all remember burnt offerings? Come on, y'all walking with me. Burnt offerings, you had to give, the whole thing was consumed. Our God is like that. Jesus wants it all. Somebody say all. I'm glad it's quiet because we should be thinking. We should be thinking about our all. Thinking about what does it merely mean to be a Christian? Did I just come? Do I just like coming to church? Because it's like I can say I went to church and I feel good about myself for the week. Did I just say a prayer? They, they told me to say a prayer. I just said a prayer. Do you, do you, 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 this, is, this is tough. This is tough. This is tough sayings, right? I, I, now, I didn't expect the reaction we got from Mr. I follow the rules. I didn't expect that reaction. Remember, he said I did all the things. Uh, it turns out that at, when he heard this, his face fell. This is what you used to get a whooping for when you was, if you grew up in a, in a black household. What your mama tell you, you better fix. Oh yeah, his face was broke. This is, he would have clearly got a whooping from his mama because his face was all the way broke. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad. But why was he sad? Because what? He had... Whew. Now, I, I have a, a, a graph of the Ten Commandments. Put that up really quick. He said he followed all the rules, but can y'all point out which rule he might have broken just in that moment? Say it out loud. Yeah. 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 How many say one? You shall have no other guys before me. Mr. I follow all the rules. And then two, what? You shall not make idols. Yeah. I, th I thought you had it all together, brother. I thought you said you followed all the rules. And yet, we see you putting other things before God and making other idols. I love this one commentary he wrote about this exchange, and he, it's as though he's saying, anything else, Lord, anything else, thou shalt have and welcome, but just not that, not that. And Christ says, that and nothing else. I must have it. If thou art to follow me, I must have it. So he walked away sorrowful. Now, this man was clearly lovable and eager and full of zeal and sincere, but we can be sincerely wrong. And he couldn't face the cost. Yet, I want you to listen to this, Jesus would rather lose a possible follower than to lower the standard for him. Indeed, there was no other possible standard. So the man went away sad from Jesus, and we don't hear from him anymore. He walked off the pages of the scriptures. He could have had one of these churches like St. Andrew, St. Peter, St. He, he could have been a St. Rich Young ruler. We didn't know his name. So lastly, after he walked away, the disciples was like, man, this is crazy. And Jesus was like, you know what, children? It's so difficult to enter the kingdom of God. This is your Jesus. Remember, he was just wor worshiping Jesus. We love you, glory. This, yo, Jesus said, it's hard to get in the kingdom of God. And they said, say what now, Jesus? <laughs> they said, this is not good for our PR campaign. Like, we're trying to get recruits. And you out here doing hard statements. Like, we want more people. And they said, no, no. Jesus said, you know what? It's so hard that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. Because it's, it's hard for people who are already full of themselves, full of, them ways, full of their ways, full of their own things to enter the kingdom of God because you have to lay everything down. The story goes that the eye of the needle was at a gate, and if the gate was locked and you were traveling with your camels and your horses and all that, there was just a small little gate, maybe half of that door, that would stay open, and then you can still get through with your, with your camels and things, but you would have to unpack everything off that camel, lay it down, and squeeze that camel through. That's the eye of the needle. Jesus is like, it's easier for a camel to go through that little bitty door than it is for people who are full of themselves. 
I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not just thinking about the money aspect. People who are full in their spirits of them own, their own selves. It's easier for them. It's hard for someone who thinks they are already rich and already got it all and already have the things. And I don't need God. Ever see people who got enough and they're like, I don't, I've talked to people, I don't even know why I need a God because I have everything. Meanwhile, all of us is like, Lord, please, Jesus, I try to pay my rent, Lord. But God going to get us off that, off, that, off that level. The kingdom of God, and I'm, I promise you I'm closing. I'm doing good on time. Um, it's so opposite. Listen, the kingdom of God, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What God was setting up everywhere Jesus went, he's like, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was Jesus' only sermon. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's here. The kingdom of God is so opposite and counterintuitive. It is often described as an upside-down kingdom where the opposites are, are what are expected from the norm. The greatest are the least. The humble are the most powerful. The rich are sent away empty. Weakness is power. God's strength is most evident when we're weak. Serving others. True power comes from serving others and laying down your life for them. Receiving by giving. You receive what you give. Enemies are loved. I pray you fail. <laughs> we embrace enemies with love as God did for us. And if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give your life up for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. What kind of kingdom is this? What type of paradox? I want you to think about what this means for your life. The kingdom of God challenges our natural ways of living and selfishness. And it provides a new way of life, a new identity, and a new kingdom. So you can take this off. The um, disciples said, they were astonished. They sitting here like, what do we sign up for? They said, now, Jesus, now this is ridiculous. Now who can be saved? Now this is too much. Now who can be saved? This is too much. How? So... I don't get it. How do we even get here? And Jesus says something so great. He's like, you know, with God, with, with man, it's impossible. It's impossible because it's counterintuitive. This is not what we, this is not how we think. This is not how we operate. We looking out for us, me, myself, and I, right? But he said with God, it, it's possible. With God, all things are possible. Jesus pointed to the solution. He makes it clear that salvation is totally a work from God. Apart from the grace of God, it is impossible for anyone. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? This is why we worship. This is why we say, hey, lift your hands. This is why we're like, hey, why don't you give God a praise? Because aside from Jesus, it's impossible. All those rules, I probably should have kept it up. All those rules, people are trying so hard to keep these rules. I got to keep. But those rules, those Ten Commandments were just a mirror to show you that you can't do it. You need a Savior. Did y'all you, you understand? And until you get to that place of depravity, I am poor in spirit, I can't do it, that's where your salvation begins. If you keep coming like, well, I'm pretty good. I don't know. I'll come to church when I feel like it, you know, because, you know, I'm doing good out here. You ain't, you, ain't, you, ain't, you ain't into the kingdom of God yet. You're getting close, but you ain't there. This is how you enter into the kingdom of God. The big takeaway, and I'm done. This is the big takeaway. I, I, all that said and done, thank you, Lord, for this example, how you dealt with this rich young ruler We've all been the rich young ruler. Amen. Yes. Big takeaway, pray for the grace to hold possessions lightly. This is what we, this is the takeaway I want you to walk away from. When you're praying at home, God, please give me the grace to hold everything you've given me to steward lightly. Yeah. Not so, I love this quote by T T Corey Tim Boone. Hold everything in your hands lightly. Otherwise, it hurts when God pries your fingers open. Whew. Been there before. 
I always say keep an open hand before God. God can always take, put in, or take away as God feels need. But if you got it, pride, oh, Lord, I'm trying to hold on to it. You can't put nothing in. You've limited your blessings at this point. But an open hand before God, God, give us the grace to hold the things you've given us loosely. Because Jesus, Jesus will always circle back for it. Are you always going to check on your idol list? Just to make sure. Like he said to um, Peter on that, on, on that, on that uh, island when he was making that, making that breakfast for all the, the disciples. He came to Peter and said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Jesus will always come back and whisper in your ear, hey, do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than these? What, how, how, this, how this sitting in your heart, right? Abraham and Isaac. Remember Abraham took Isaac up to the mountain? God didn't want to kill Isaac. If, it, if that's what you took away from that story, that you, you missed the whole point. That was just a test, a check of your heart, Abraham. Would you be willing to give him up if I asked you to? Even when he was about to, he was like, man, I'll just play this. I'll put that, put that away. I don't know. Stop, stop, right? It's God, Jesus is always going to circle back. God, give us the grace to steward the things you give us. You know, people don't belong to us. I'm going to say it again. People don't belong to us. People belong to who? God loves the people who you love more than you love them. People don't belong to us. Money is a tool. It's not to build our self-esteem. It's not for us to floss, but it's for us to be a blessing. Lord, teach us fluidity. We just need to be able to flow in God. Ebbs and flows of life. You can take it. I can leave it. It doesn't matter. I'm content with. Paul said, I've learned the secret of all. I I don't know about y'all. I've learned the secret. No matter if I'm up or down, rich or poor, I can do what? All All things through Christ who's driven. That's what that, that chapter is talking about. It's not talking about running a marathon even though you can in Jesus' name. But Paul said, no matter what the situation, I'm content. I'm content. I've learned the secret. Last thing. Don't let your possessions possess you. This is the key. Don't let it have you. You can have them. God's not saying, we're not saying go sell, you know, that was that man's assignment. We take and be like, see, Jesus want us to sell everything. Well, that's not, what, you think that was a universal principle? Or was he talking to that guy for his thing? But what is God telling, talking to you about your thing? Right? Will you go? Will you, will, you, will you not let these things control you? It says in Luke, be on the watch out. Guard against all types of greed. Because life does not consist in abundance of possessions. My God. That's the word of God. Ask yourself, am I finding security in the amount of money in my bank account? Things to ponder. Am I finding a false sense of confidence in a relationship, job, or position? You like giving out your business card? Like you, you know I'm working over here. Right? I, I, have I put too much trust in the things of this world to provide me stability and security? Are the things in my life, are there things in my life that if they disappear tomorrow, my hope would go to? If God was like, yeah, I need that back, would you be able to go on? Or would you just, that's it, God, just take me now, Jesus. We could barely do coffee. Oh, no coffee. They ain't serving us. Let this, let this not be no coffee here in the morning. Do you see how the saints go to acting? <laughs> we ain't got no coffee. No, I'll be back. Y'all going down to Target. <laughs> I digress. Here's our action steps. Do not measure. You can, let's stand. Let's stand. You can stand. This is our, this is our prayer. Don't measure your self-worth by your financial status. Understand that your value is not tied to your possessions. The greatest things in life are not things. 
You came into this world with nothing. You're going to leave with nothing. Life is not centered around a, um, gaining achievements or acquiring things, but it revolves around building relationships and loving God and loving people. The best way to remember that your life is not about things is to build it on eternal priorities. This is what Jesus was trying to tell the young man. Like, hey, if you give it away, I got you. You going These little 70, 80 years is nothing compared to eternity. Do y'all hear me? So build for eternity. Love remains. Truth remains. Build on these things. Cuz every possession is temporary. So you got a choice to make as we're closing. The world is telling you that you need to get more to be happier. You need to be more successful, more important, more influential, more valuable, more secure. But you have to decide, am I going to listen to culture or am I going to listen to Christ? Am I going to listen to the world or the word? One will leave you dissatisfied for the rest of your life. And one will make you truly happy. You can live a life without God. I love that Jesus gave him a choice. Do y'all appreciate that about Jesus? He didn't make him. No, you're going to be a disciple. Hmm. All right. God bless you, brother. Would have been great. I like to think that later in his years, he might have turned around and gave it all away. I just have that hope. We don't know what little. He, though, he became a, a old a rich old ruler. Maybe he's moderately, moderately wealthy. I don't know. Our last verse, can you put it up on the screen? I love what Paul says. This is the quick, I'm sorry, I had a lot of verses. I'm, I just, I start geeking out. I'm sorry, y'all. But this is the last verse, I promise. Paul gave a list before this of all the things, all his accomplishments. I've done this, I've done that. Y'all think y'all doing something. I was a real Pharisee. Like, he had a whole list. And then he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Another translation says, Count, count it as dumb. You can translate that in a ghetto translation if you want to. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, like our, like our boy, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that you may know him. It's the goal. The power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. This is how we don't let possessions keep a grip on us. The goal is to know Jesus. The goal is to know him in his power, to know him in his resurrection. I love that. And his suffering. We don't like that part. But this is the real cost of Christianity. Too often we rush to altar calls. Come on, anybody want to give your life to God? Say this prayer. And we don't allow people to really think about what it's going to cost them. It's going to cost you everything. Do you understand that? You should not make a decision to follow Jesus lightly. It's going to cost you everything. For some dear saints, it costs them their very lives. Think about your relationship with God. We can move to a reflection. Think about Think about your commitment. Is this something that you really want to do? Is this something that you want to give your life for? But if you do, you gain everything. It's the beautiful paradox. You give it away to gain even more. You go find it and you find the great treasure. You go look for it and you end up having the pearl of great price. You end up having the lost coin. You end up having everything you need for life and godliness when you give it away. Yes, beautiful. Does Lauren have a mic? Oh, Lord. Lauren needs a mic. Can someone help Lauren get a mic? 
If you come to the village, we will be going over these discussion questions. Feel free to take a picture if you want to go through it now. I feel like I have talked a lot, and I'm not reading all these. <laughs> I will spare your, your eardrums. Um, but these are some great questions to reflect on for the rest of the week. We'll be talking about it on Wednesday. But I want you to take some time. We're not going to even do like a altar call per se. I just really want you to take some time to reflect. Why don't you close your eyes? Don't worry about who's around you. It's all or nothing. This is the call to follow Jesus. If you are looking to move from being just in the crowd to really following Jesus and being a disciple, it costs everything. It's not always comfortable. It's not always fun. Sometimes it's isolating. Sometimes people don't understand you. You're misunderstood. They think you're acting stuck up. You don't want to hang like you used to. Why you don't want to smoke with us no more? Why you ain't going to the club with us? Why you not doing all these things? Oh, it's going to cost you something. But you're going to gain everything. You're going to gain peace. You'll gain joy. You'll gain You'll gain a righteousness that's not your own. You'll gain power to be a witness for Jesus. You'll gain a life like you've never known. That's true life in abundance. When you try to keep it, you lose it. You lose it, you get it. I love the Lord. So God, we just pray over these precious saints. When you look on us, Jesus, you love us. We thank you for your eyes, your, your, your gaze upon us, God. Thank you that you're so patient, even in this interaction with this young man. You saw him. You loved him. You challenged him. You gave him a choice. So uh, we, we, we thank you for that. And so there are people here in this audience who have said, God, I have counted the cost, and I truly want to follow you no matter what it costs. If you're that person, why don't you make a, a new commitment to Jesus today? It's all or nothing. And Jesus, I choose you. I choose you, Jesus. Can someone just say that to you? I choose you, God. I, I, I want you. I'm, I'm giving, I'll give it all away. I'll give it all away, Jesus. But it can't be done in my own strength. I need your power. Come on, if you need the power of God to come upon you, why don't you lift your hands? God, I need grace. I'm empty and I'm bankrupt within myself. I need your spirit to help me to make these choices. I can't do it on my own, but all you want is a yes. Can someone give God a yes? God, I don't know how to do it, but I say yes. I don't know how to start giving these things in my life away, but I say yes to you, God. I choose you. I want you no matter what the cost because I will gain treasure not only in heaven, but here on earth. So God, we are committing ourselves to you afresh. We say yes to you. We choose you. God, help us. Help us not to let possessions possess us. Help us to hold things in our, in our lives lightly. Help us to hold people in our lives lightly because you are going to require each one of us to be called back to you. So God, help us to hold people dearly and with love, with the image of God that you've given each person. God, we pray that you would be glorified in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we